Schönen Tag. Schönen Tag. Ready? Draw? Well, let's, let's open up a few questions here. The first one is uh, an original uh, question. Never been asked this one before. Um, thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm. Could you please teach us a self defense technique? <coughs> when child is born with sensitive, radiant, compassionate soul, where are people who will want to. There are people who want to exploit and take advantage. How do you make the child stronger? Thank you. Yes. Uh, usually the child is sensitive and if it's kind and even fearless, sometimes that compassion would actually make it invulnerable. People will want, not want to harm you. And uh, you have friends who will look after you. Uh, Self-defense Obviously, that uh, there is no such real thing if you try violence, and there will always be someone who's more violent than you. So instead, just like kindness and animals, people don't harm you. There was many stories. When I was working in um, prisons, these were really rough prisons. Uh, in some of those prisons, you know, there, there was. Uh, People, the inmates were in there for such a long time that they had nothing to lose. If they attacked you, you know, I was a man, but they would rape uh, men in there. And they would just add you know, hardly anything to their sentence because they could probably die in the jail anyway. So they had nothing to lose. So when I went into one of the prisons, uh, the, the guards, they told me that they had a new security system installed what looked like um, smoke detectors they were actually um, alarm detectors and they gave me a, a pen just like the pen you have there just an ordinary pen but if you press the top of the pen and pointed it at the alarm then it would uh, uh, go off and the guards will run to save you they would know exactly where you were in the prison there was a new security uh, device and so the guards gave me one of these pens. I had to give it back when I uh, checked out. They gave me one of these uh, pens and said, "Put it in your pocket." At which point I said, um, <laughs> "I don't have a pocket." They <coughs> said, "I'll just hold it, put it anywhere." But they said, "Don't tell the prisoners about this because it's top security, it's secret." And I went into the, my meditation class. And the first thing that one of the uh, students said, oh, you've got one of those security pens too. <laughs> <laughs> of course they all knew. <laughs> and then he looked me in the eye, he was a really big prisoner, very, very uh, strong. He looked me in the eye and said, I don't know, do you think you could even press the top of that pen? before I attacked you. <laughs> and I said, no, I probably wouldn't get close to it. Yes, I'm that fast, he said. But he said, because you've been kind to the people in prison, that no one would do that to you. If anyone tried, there'd be about five or six cribs who will stop them. <coughs> that was my self-defense. I'd been calm, kind, sorry, and caring. And so I had all these people, my security, prisoners inside the jail, would never let any harm come to me. That was my defence. Good karma and kindness. So that is what I would uh, suggest. If you try and learn some martial art, you may try that, but there's always somebody who will be better than you in that martial art. But kindness, when people care for you, I love you. They'll protect you. Although once I was a bit stupid. I remember just when I was staying with my mum in, in Acton and I was going to give a talk at the Chiswick Vihara. Uh, uh, that was when it was in Heathworth Gardens. And I, that's the area I grew up. That's my area. So 
I walked a shortcut past uh, South Acton where it was a very rough area and there was a group of young men, uh, 16, 17, congregating on a Saturday night and as soon as they saw me coming they started chanting <coughs> Buddha, 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 Buddha <laughs> trying to intimidate me and as I came closer Buddha, 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 Buddha <laughs> and so as I came closer you know, I was not going to cross the other side of the road I was going to go right through them and as I got closer I did my Kung Fu pose <laughs> The only thing I knew about Kung Fu is seeing little grasshopper on the TV series Kung Fu when I was a kid. But that was enough of us. I had the road, I had the confidence, and they parted and let me through. <laughs> Bluff. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. You yeah, had the sort of the guts and just the ability <laughs> to do that, fearlessness. And of course, it's the kindness is much better than playing around like that. But of course, there's also that wonderful Ajahn Gunha, still alive, and who are sitting meditating in the jungle. And the big King Cobra came up to him. Head up, opened his hood. <laughs> sorry about that. I should stop doing that. <laughs> Sometimes I always, always give people heart attacks. <laughs> right in front of his nose. And this monk just calmly just lifted up his, his hand and patted the cobra on the head. Well, his other monk saw it, not fake. He patted, saying in Thai, a thank you for coming to visit me. And that cobra they enjoyed every moment of that. It's so rare to get your head patted <laughs> by a great monk. <coughs> and then what happened? The monks told the story, it's a hilarious story, the real story of you know, real sort of monks in the forest. And then the cobra put his head down and went to see the other monk. <laughs> Lifted up his head. And the second monk said, go back to him, I'm not doing that. <laughs> But of course, the snake would not bite, simply because you were kind. That's one of the best self-defense, being kind. And animals, humans, they just don't want to hurt you. Ajahn Brahm, could you please say something why the forest Sangha monks and Ajahn Sumedha haven't taught jhanas as far as I know? Thank you. I think at first of all, they didn't teach jhanas. I think they start teaching them now. Again, sometimes you have to be uh, careful when you're teaching drivers because a lot of times, uh, as soon as you teach them like I do, we want them, we crave them, especially when you market it like, oh, bliss better than sex, really wonderful, you can just get these numbers and push them all over your body and heal this and heal that. Really, really attractive. But then again, you've got to be very careful. And the carefulness means understand that they only arise out of contentment. Peace upon peace upon peace. Not want upon want upon want. Peace upon peace upon peace. And you know, it's, people do get them, but not that many. You've got to be honest with you. And, but nevertheless it's worth having a, having a, a non-go. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say have a go, but that's wrong. Have a stop. Having a good stop, yeah. And then people get close to them and they know what... A lot of time people don't uh, attain these things or achieve or experience or enjoy them simply because they're trying too hard. So anyway, uh, I once did a course... I once did a course with Lee Brassington who taught the child of Sadhguru Kena. <coughs> Yeah, now it's very popular, jhanas. So, a lot of people teach them, but it's said that when you ask me what is a jhana, then I have a very high standard. So it's hard to actually get me to confirm you've got a jhana. 
Dear Ajahn Emperor, a few days ago there was an article in a newspaper under the heading The Dark Side of Mindfulness. Yeah. It found it, it focused on an individual who was advised by a GP to use mindfulness app to uh, relieve her anxiety. She had said that her anxiety was heightened by using techniques such as mindfulness walking. What do people like her get wrong in such situations? Uh, I don't think I remember. It was actually a, it was an article in The Guardian, I think I read. <coughs> and I think well, one thing, there's some striving there, try to do something. I've never found a problem when people use a lot of kindness and gentleness. Because again, the mindfulness practices which people teach, they learn it from other people, who learn it from other people, who learn it from other people. It doesn't actually come from a very deep personal experience. And it's, you know, it's mindfulness, it's not kindfulness. It's not sort of based on other things such as uh, learning just how to, you know, be a good person, a kind person, a sensitive person on some virtue. And you know, little things like what I was mentioning about right motivation. We're do, doing this to let go. And of course mindfulness is not a, a silver bullet which actually um, uh, cures everything. So in other words, if I fall over and break my leg, I'm not going to say I'll just be mindful. Mindful, mindful. I call an ambulance and go to hospital because they're much better at fixing broken legs than meditating. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it, it can be because people ask too much of mindfulness, they promise too much of mindfulness and they don't do too much. Mindfulness is only one part of a huge path. It's called the Eightfold Path. And when mindfulness is taken out, just use alone. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Now water is good for you. If that's all you ever eat or drink or consume is water, you know you'll die. But sometimes it's taken out of context. <coughs> but that's not to say that um, you know that you should stop mindfulness because sometimes <coughs> if you go to the gym and exercise. Some people just um, uh, get sick when they go to the gym, or they fall over and die when they go to the gym. It doesn't mean that you should never go to the gym. Sometimes we live in a society where one pe person dies, you know, because they get it wrong, they the wrong instructions, and we think the whole industry is wrong. So, because of that, yeah, you know, people in Australia they still go surfing and swim in the ocean even though there's some sharks. And uh, some people die. People go skateboarding, what other things they do? Uh, bungee jumping or whatever, and the rope bus or whatever. So there's many th ways to die. <laughs> <laughs> so take your choice. But <laughs> I've never had anyone die yet by meditating. I've got a very good record. So anyway, thank you so much for your teachings. The first time I went to a retreat in a monastery north of Thailand and I had no clue of what I was doing and what to expect. I naturally ended up in the jhanas without knowing what it was and they did not explain to me. But when I left the monastery, my whole life had changed and I was, had become so sensitized, so I would escape the normal world and go to different retreats. When I went to Goenka, I, it, re, it really purified me and I, it is easier technique to keep every day than the one I learned in Thailand. But I have never gone out the travels with Goenka technique, even if I have been to four retreats in his tradition. But every time I go to the Thai monastery, I do out for jhanas. Why is that? They like that. But sometimes people just don't <coughs> encourage people to do the jhanas, and because it's not encouraged, people just don't do it in those traditions. 
And if they do get close, they say, oh, stop it, you get attached. Other times, sometimes you do need long periods of time. So if you're always having to get up and then walk, the bell goes, you're just about to get to go, bong, and you have to get up to do walking, and you're really getting, you know, really into the walking, bong, you've got to go sit down again, and you're just about to get into full enlightenment, bong. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but there's something about, you know, bells. You know, that was just what you do at school, and just it's like training. It's discipline from the outside rather than discipline from the inside. So maybe I just got traumatized by bells. And instead just like to keep things natural. But when I'm meditating, it was a really good meditation, just keep going. Meditate all night if you want to, and then sleep in the morning. But at least you're using your natural energies rather than having them imposed upon you. And which means that you meditate when you should be in bed and you're in bed when you should be meditating. <laughs> <coughs> so I think that's one of the reasons. You work with your body. You work with the uh, situations outside and inside, not against them. Is it possible to get Rupa jhanas by controlling the breath in any way, legs, etc.? In the first jhana, is it possible to shake, levitate, make noises, etc.? Did you say earlier to use a Rupa Jhanas to enter and Rupa Jhanas to come out? I'm sure I misunderstood, misheard you. Okay, that the, this is coming soon, probably the last day of the or something, when I sort of uh, mention more about what are the Jhanas, what aren't the Jhanas. One of the other things when make the Jhanas uh, popular is the standard goes down like popularising anything. Sort of what are the real jhanas, they're actually quite rare and what people say are the jhanas and when I say to you that wasn't the jhana, you get very upset at me. It's very disappointing when you think you have a jhana and you find out it's not. And that's why people usually go to other monks or nuns <laughs> who've got lower standards and that's not so disappointing. But by controlling the breath in any way, <laughs> it's the breath has to disappear before you go into jhanas. You know, like I said in that simile of five pasana and samatha and metta, the dog, and anapana. Anapana disappears, the breath, you can't, you're not. It's too gross to actually to experience a jhana. And so you go to the delightful breath and you go to these mental images of many tissues, that's what they refined, that's what takes you into the jhanas. And controlling the breath, you control the breath. What you can do by controlling the breath, especially if you put it in a place like a tip of a nose and really focus there, put a lot of energy, you can get to some nimittas. But you cannot let the nimitta go to get into the jhana. You get stuck there because you've been controlling, controlling, controlling using force. And of course, you know, these nimittas are state, these are jhanas are stages of letting go. You have to just, your sense of self and will, which is an important part of the sense of self, has to disappear. And you can't let it disappear because you've got all that way by using willpower. And you can't just turn it off now. <coughs> it's one of the reasons why if you let go early on in the past of meditation, more letting go, more letting go, more letting go. So look at that glass of water there. It's still for a long time. Because I haven't held it, I just let it go. And it's still all by itself. That's how these things work. <coughs> Did I say I had to use the Arupa Chinas to enter? Arupa Chinas? No way. <coughs> <coughs> Even Arupa, we never call them Arupa Chinas. The Chinas are reserved, that word is reserved for the, the four Chinas. And uh, based on those, when you get, if you ever do get to a, a fourth um, jhana, incredibly still, very peaceful, what happens when this stillness, things start to vanish and disappear? The mind and the brain only notices things which move. When it's still, <coughs> when it's still it disappears, vanishes. So you can understand in a, you know, in a fourth jhana, so incredibly still and peaceful, 
they vanish. Little by little, the world has already stopped. So it's little parts of your knowing, your consciousness, your mind starts to disintegrate and disappear. Little by little. <coughs> That's how the Arupa work. They call them Arupa because um, they are totally material. It's basically perceptions. Ajahn Brahm, no Venerable Chandra has a kind heart. It seems to be very strict. You know, <coughs> strict. You're a softy. Do you think that she should run the nuns monastery according to a strict discipline or according to ABC method? Ajahn Brahm Chan. She let her do it her way, whatever it is, but sometimes people are calm and they're good. <coughs> some, some people think they're strict. I don't think she's strict. She's uh, kind as well. She's been brainwashed by me for how many years now? <laughs> many years. So, she'll do it. I have been having some nice peaceful meditations. At time the breath becomes quite fine and delicate and my mind feels calm and very present. I'm still aware of the body, aches in the legs, although at such times they don't feel like pain, just sensations and the periphery of awareness. It does not seem an intrusion, then the sensation intensifies, should I then bring it more clearly into awareness and give it metal or should I ignore it? and focus on the breath. Sometimes this feels like I am being too forceful. You can experiment if you like, but one of the uh, wonderful um, advantages, first of all, of not focusing your uh, attention on the breath, on any part of the body. Don't focus on the, the belly or on the tip of the nose, because that keeps the body awareness. And if you just disembody the breath, you're just watching breathing in, breathing out, you haven't got a clue where that is on your body, that means there's more chance your body will vanish, fall off the radar. And that's actually what is supposed to happen. <coughs> when you're aware of the breath, you don't care where it is in your body, because you're trying to allow the body to disappear and vanish. You're sitting in a comfortable position, you don't always have to sit on the floor, now you can sort of sit with your your back against the wall, put your feet out. I know that's in the Thai tradition, they say, Ooh, you should never point your feet at a monk or a nun or a Buddha. It's hopeless. There's always a monk or a Buddha or something somewhere in the temple, whichever way you point your feet. <laughs> Please excuse my irreverence, but that's what happens. So it's more important that you are comfortable. And so now that's respect for the, the teachings. So you're actually meditating. That's more respectful anywhere, your feet towards the Buddha or whatever. If you're meditating and just really relaxing your mind, then the Buddha will never object. In all those years I've seen people meditating in front of a Buddha statue, pointing their feet out to it. Never once have I heard the Buddha complain. <laughs> <laughs> Even the monks don't complain, it's other people who complain. But anyway, so um, make your body comfortable so the body can vanish and disappear. And once the body vanishes, you've only got the breath left, you haven't got a clue where it is on the body. That's a very good thing because then the body just starts to vanish. And you, you can't feel aches and pains. Like I said, you can't feel the mosquitoes biting you. You do that as soon as possible. I remember one occasion, oh, I don't like saying this, uh, I was travelling from one monastery to another monastery in the north of Thailand. And just you know, after the, the early breakfast, I just got a, a bus, a very slow bus, just cramped into a seat which was supposed to be for two people, but three people were in it. And it was really uncomfortable. A very hot day, and when I got to the destination, I was really sore and tired and thirsty. 
And I think I got to the destination about, uh, yeah, I think it was about 4.30, and I thought, I can have a nice little shower, have a rest. And then when I checked into this one, she said, oh great, you're just in time. You know, another 15 minutes, I think it was at 5 o'clock, we do our, our usual evening four-hour sit. <laughs> <laughs> And I wouldn't have minded, but you know, I was just sore. And so I hurriedly just you know, had some water and just, um, you know, just showered my body as quickly as I possibly could and went to sit for four hours. And the problem was that I knew that, you know, I had, had much exercise, a bit sort of stiff. You had to get rid of your body pretty quickly. I knew that from experience, I had about 15 minutes or 20 minutes to get beyond the body, otherwise it would really ache, it would be a torture for four hours. So, you know, that's what you did. You know, you just, you know, you just let go, relax the body as much as possible, go inside, open up the lotus, so you're way uh, out of touch of your body. So you're inside and having a wonderful time. I remember just that, you know, when uh, the bird eventually went, it was about 10 minutes early. It was only 3 hours and 50 minutes, and I complained. Mm. You took away ten of my minutes. But I knew that you had to get you know, beyond the body fast. And the amazing thing is, that if you do get beyond your body, so you can't feel her, and it looks after itself really well. If I meditate for an hour, especially now my age, sometimes you get a bit stiff here, and I have to stretch my legs. But if you have the opportunity to meditate for four hours or five hours, when you come out, you've got no pain at all. It's so fresh and easy. It doesn't make sense. Why is it the longer you sit, the less aches and pains you have? But that's what happens if you get deeper meditation. So you come out of these deep meditations you now for hours, and there's nothing wrong with my body at all. My knees should be really achy. They ain't. They're fine. So there is something about when your body is very still, sort of it heals itself and the aches and pains just disappear. So if that's the case for you, just see if you can just let go of the body as soon as possible. And just stay with the breath. And you focus on the breath, everything else falls off the screen. You've just got the breath going in, going out, you can't feel your body, you don't know what it's doing. And then afterwards, you just go deeper into that breath. It's very peaceful, very beautiful. And then after that, that turns into limitless and stuff. Why there is bliss after Nibbana if Nibbana ceases everything? Metaphor with the candle and flame scares me a bit. I can't imagine being happy and at the same time not existing. Thank you. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, first of all, very blissful, very beautiful. And to answer that question, there was a sutta with um, Yamaka and Sariputta. So how can you say that when a person, not just Nibbana's, Pari Nibbana's, totally extinguished, gone, poof, forever, how can you call out the highest happiness and bliss? And Sariputta so asks it very, very beautifully. If you are sick with an illness, when the sickness vanishes, there's happiness. Each one of these happinesses, it's not you experiencing happiness, it's called the end of an affliction, impersonal. So with this question, it makes me scared. I can't imagine how I can experience happiness when everything stops. The problem is the eye. You're vanishing, you're disappearing, you're going. There's nothing there anyway to begin with. And when the sense of self and I vanishes, that's bliss. It's not reaffirming and strengthening your sense of identity. It's your going. You're gone, baby. <laughs> and some people they think, oh that's scary, what's the point of doing all that hard work <laughs> and you can't enjoy it? The problem, whenever there's a you there, there's a problem. 
I think I said that the first day that a lovely little um, um, comic, three, one, two, three, four frames, an angry meditator with a sign, I want happiness. The second frame, sort of the monk, the master, the, let's make it a nun teacher, she takes a sign and first problem, I. So she scr <coughs> scrubs that out. So it's left with want, happiness. Next problem, want. So scrubs that out. And the fourth frame, she holds up the sign, happiness. And everyone is smiling. The problem is, is I. The me. Any happiness you ever have, you interfere with it. You are afraid of it because it's not under your control, or you sort of uh, destroy it because you want more, or you want it you know, to keep it, control it. Yeah. People tell me that many relationships um, they just fall apart because people are afraid of it falling apart. They control. Because they control their partner, suspicious, I just want this relationship you know, to last, it's the best one I've ever had. And because they're afraid of it failing, they destroy it. Weird, isn't it? So if we can only just get out of the way, we can enjoy it much more. It lasts much longer when we don't interfere. It just becomes natural. It's the same way with meditation. You just let it happen. You get out of the way. You disappear. What's the big thing with an eye anyway? It just causes so much problem. But we're used to having a sense of self. That's why we just ooh, in trouble when it starts to vanish. <coughs> Dear Ajahn, whether the jhanas are specifically taught or not, are they they not just stages on the path which would automatically happen? when the mind is clear enough, yeah, they just happen anyway. But sometimes when they do happen, people don't know what the heck was that. And it sort of disturbs them because, you know, it wasn't really taught. It's just, sometimes it's nice to have a map, so you know where you're going when you get there, and just what this is, so you haven't lost the past. Sometimes, the, say, the breath disappears. In Nimitta land, when you're in Nimitta land, the breath disappears, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to watch the breath. So you destroy the whole process by going back to the breath, you think you're doing something wrong. <laughs> That's why there are sometimes that we're so addicted to being told we're doing something wrong. I was at that, uh, oh, in my generation, the Bob Dylan song, uh, something you're doing something wrong, not sure, not sure when, but you're doing it again. <laughs> And it's just like an anthem which people are brought up with. Just, you're always doing something wrong, just don't do it. What, what am I doing wrong? I don't know, but you're doing it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> uh, so we're just so afraid of doing something wrong, we live in meditation. Is this right? It can't be right now. I must be doing something wrong. So how about thinking, oh, I might be doing something right for change. So anyway, then what happens is, uh, after a while, if you teach the jhanas and teach them you know, in detail, so people know what's going on, why not? So you know, you teach. How many of you have you know learned astronomy and uh, learn about the solar system and learn about? Will you ever go there? No flat chance of you ever going to Mars, but you learn about it. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it makes it life interesting. Get the bigger picture of what's going on. <coughs> please, Bante, please explain how and why the translation from body sense space to mind sense space occurs, the transition, sorry. Other than when Nimitta appears, thank you. Um, that will come up tomorrow because I'm going to be uh, just, I think I flagged this. Uh, set up what I was going to do. When we do the uh, continuation of the Satipatthana Sutta, 
I'm going to just go to how Anapanasati fulfills the Satipatthana. And there it's very clear just how when we, <coughs> when we go during the breath meditation from the full awareness of the breath and calming the breath, it gets delightful. And when it gets delightful, that, that joy with the breathing really builds up, the Piti Sukha comes, and that not only just means that you know, you're just enjoying watching the breath, it's wonderful, but it also means that you're actually noticing a transition, because the joy is stronger than the physical feeling. And it just dominates. Whoever shouts the loudest is the one who is heard. So when it comes to uh, the uh, awareness, whichever is the strongest, the most attractive, that is where the mindfulness gets pulled to. And so the, the, what they call the citta sankara of the, the happiness, the how the mind interprets the breath, that gets so strong that it's beautiful, delightful. And so that's why you start to be watching the breath, it just happens naturally, you don't transition. But <coughs> sometimes people say, well, you know, am I still watching the breath? You are watching the breath, but it appears different. In the same way that the only simile which I sometimes say is that you have a person you've known for a long time and then they go off and uh, ordain as a, a monk or a nun. And you see them, you say, is that you, David? Is that you? Because you do look different with a brown head and a uh, so bald head, not brown head, <laughs> a bald head and a brown robe. And so, they're, oh yeah, I see you've ordained, wonderful. Because it's a slightly different perception is required. So that's why the, when the breath becomes refined, it's still the breath, but you have to uh, recognize it. Oh yeah, it's the same old breath, but now I'm seeing it through the, the mind sense. I'm feeling it rather than, I'm sorry, I'm knowing it rather than feeling it. So you get to really know how these senses work. Another ghost question. <laughs> I love ghosts, that ghost movie. <coughs> In Sri Lanka, some people believe that if Pirit chanting, that's some holy chanting, three sutras is even played in the house, go <coughs> Ghosts will not stay there. I don't understand this either. The Pali chanting has some magical powers, or ghosts understand Pali. Neither of these can't be true according to my understanding. Please could you clarify? Played on recording or radio, not a person doing it. It really depends because if, the Pali, if that's a, the chanting you like and love and you're used to it, <coughs> just when you die, you'd actually get attracted to it. Uh, the, I'm of I'm, uh, the age now that many people who die, you know, I, this is my age group now is starting to die. And it's a custom to play the deceased person's favourite songs. So now I get to hear my favourite songs. <laughs> because I like to do that at the funeral ceremonies. So I've even heard sort of Jimi Hendrix play instead of... Um, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, he says, oh, Frank, I, I did it my way. <laughs> <laughs> and also, one of the latest funerals, I know uh, the um, George Harrison's uh, all along, uh, uh, throughout the universe. What is it? Rain comes falling across my paper cup and lingers slowly as it goes, as it goes along the universe. Jai Guru Deva oh. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and I haven't broken my precepts by singing because no one in their right mind could call what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hear all your old songs. So sometimes, that, you know, you get attracted to things which you know and remember. So even I would imagine that some Devas, or Devas especially, but even ghosts, they say, ah, oh, they're playing my song. <laughs> I go and listen. Maybe. But it's also that, you know, a lot of times that, that 
goes to see. They like to receive good karma, matter from people, but a lot of times, oh, one house I went to, um, there was a ghost there, and it was just messing around and disturbing people. And so that when they do things like that, they, the owners came up and they just, they, they had, I think, a Catholic exorcism and, and a Protestant and had the, uh, who was it, the, the Taoists, and they eventually got me. And then I told them, I said, listen, just, that ghost is really pissed off that you're trying to get rid of it. So we did some chanting to appease the ghost, to say, look, this house is big enough for, for all of you. Okay, so ghosts, you're welcome in this house. But just, you know, behave. Just don't disturb the people, especially at night when they're trying to go to sleep. Just, you know, just have some kindness for the residents and you can live here as long as you like. And that was the end of the problem. So trying to get rid of a ghost, imagine that's you, that's your house, and to try and get rid of you, of course you'll get fed up and, and <coughs> throw a tantrum. There's another couple <laughs> that their TV kept on turning off and turning on to, a, like I think it's a sports programme. So they you know, on the remote control, they would sort of turn it back onto the movie they were watching, <coughs> and they would go back to the sports program. And I thought, what's going on here? And I told them it was obvious, you know, they knew there was something in the house. The ghost in that house just liked watching sports. There was a guy who died there. And so I said, what should we do? Can you get rid of the ghost? No, don't get rid of the ghost. The solution was obvious. <laughs> Buy another TV. <laughs> One for the ghost and one for you. <laughs> so now the ghost has his TV and you have your TV. The problem solved. And that's a true story. It should be a joke, but that's true. The <laughs> 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 ghosts have their rights as well. Human rights for ghosts. No, that's a human rights. Ghost rights. You know, so many rights for all sorts of animals and humans and and disadvantaged people, ghosts are disadvantaged. So I give them a break. Ghost rights. That's where they love me. <laughs> anyway, so don't try to get rid of the ghosts, just calm down. They're your friends. They're supposed to be Buddhists. Compassion, for goodness sake. May all beings be happy in the world. That includes ghosts. Why did you choose the Theravada tradition over other Buddhist traditions? What is special about the one in your view? <laughs> That's a good story and the answer is, you might think that this is a, a superficial answer, but this was true. I had, you know, at that time, was it 72, 73, uh, I was looking for a place to ordain as a monk. And so I went to all the different traditions which were around in, in London at the time and in our up country. Uh, the Zen didn't like them at all. They'd hit you. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I said they made the best custard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were just not friendly. The, please excuse me, the Sri Lankans at the time, they were very scholastic, but you know, they didn't have a sense of like peace and inner wisdom. They could quote the text and teach you Pali. You had the, uh, the Burmese, they were just really fierce. They were not fierce, like funless, no joy. The Tibetans, yeah, they were joyful. And so was the Thais, which I saw in Wimbledon. They were sort of <coughs> you know, smiling. And so it really was between the Thais and the Tibetans, you know, who was the happiest. Because I always understood if you're going to be to a spiritual path, what's the point of spending your rest of your life in misery? <laughs> I wanted a happy path. Then I sometimes realised, I had enough understanding of Buddhism, that meditation, uh, practicing virtue, is supposed to give you happiness and well-being. And so it just happened the Thai path, you know, Thai monks I knew, they seemed to be the happiest. So that's where I went. And of course, you know, you're in Bangkok for a while, but then 
you know, he had a really great good fortune to see a real teacher like an Ajahn Chah. And he really was sort of happy, powerfully happy. And you know, amazing the sort of stuff which he taught. So that was just really um, got me going. So once you see someone like that, that's it, just staying there. <coughs> nice thing about um, the old Buddhist traditions, you can actually try, give it a try, and if you don't like it, it doesn't suit you, you can always leave. So you don't commit forever. So when I first ordained, I knew that you could leave at any time. Right now I can leave and just become a lay person, just like that, so easy to do. The only reason you stay is because you want to, you enjoy it, you're having fun, you're getting fulfilled. So I really feel for so the Catholic priests, they ordain when they're young and there's no way out. Once a priest, always a priest. They can't sort of just say, well, I'm not a priest anymore. So you know, they're, they're in a box and that's one of the reasons why their celibacy you know, causes problems for them. For a monk or for a nun, just they feel, okay, they've had enough of this, they can just leave and well done, you've done so many months, so many years as, as in the robes. Well done. You're not considered to be a failure. You're honest. So anyway, to be honest, the idea of extinguishment in Nibbana is really scary. How can we let go of that fear? By reaching Nibbana. <laughs> the Buddha actually said this specifically that he said, well, some people when I teach non-self get afraid, get scared. This is part of the course. There's no reason why I won't teach it. You put this in your, your brain, in your head, and it's a, a seed. And later you realize more scary is being immortal. That's a real scary one. We don't actually really consider that. We just want to keep going on and 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 on. And I did mention Groundhog Day, that vampire movie. Eternal existence, that is the scariest. Even Ao Chan Cha, he would always say that even when he was young, he always wanted things which had an ending. Not went on and on and on and on. Doesn't matter how wonderful it is, the longer it goes on, the more the French word ennui. You just you're bored, been there, done that, nothing sort of really gets to you anymore. That's the nature of the sense world, even the mind world. So that's one of the reasons why and the Buddha said it very clearly that everything vanishes and disappears. Now, where is that? I had that the other day. It's in here. Uh, actually, you just almost got it straight away. Next page. <coughs> this is from Samyutta Nikaya 48.53. It's about an enlightenment, third noble truth. An arahat, an enlightened one, understands that the six senses sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind, and the mind, will cease completely and totally without remainder, and no other senses will arise anywhere in any way. This is another way one knows that there is nothing more to be done for an hour hut. That's some Eutonicaia 48, 53. It's the clearest, obvious, apparent. You can't really go around interpreting any other way. That for an hour hut, after it's all finished, then nothing, no other senses arise. It's gone. If you don't know not self, if you haven't tasted not self, especially if you haven't tasted jhanas, yeah, that's scary. But if you tasted a real jhana, it's not scary, it's a huge relief. 
That's why I'm saying more about that tomorrow morning. But the experience of jhanas opens up a path to enlightenment. I'm not scared anymore. Actually, you're scared of continuing on forever and ever and ever. Dear Ajahn, is dying with morphine as a painkiller an obstacle to going to the light? No. Because, I, where did I mention this? I think this, if you want to go online, Wikipedia or somewhere, it's called terminal lucidity. Even people who have comas, they become clear in the last moments before they die. Uh, people have really lots of morphine in them, painkillers, so they're in a fog, they don't feel any pain, they hardly feel anything. In the last moments of their life, their brain stops basically, it's just dysfunctional, and the mind takes over and it's really clear. People with dementia, they haven't known who the hell you were, you've been visiting them every day, and then be careful. They tell you, so David, welcome, well, where have you been? They're going to die in a moment. Because that's the terminal lucidity. It's great they have, it's only the last year I've heard there's a name for it, terminal lucidity. So now it's got a name, <coughs> it must exist. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the teaching, your compassion. Can one meditate lying down? Yes, you can lie down, it's one of the traditional four postures. But if you want to really do lots of meditation lying down, have a posture for sleep lying down and have a posture for meditating lying down. For me, when I go to sleep, I go on my right side or my left side, I go to sleep on my side. And, but when I want to meditate, I lie on my back. I just developed that over the years. And so now, if I lay on my back, I just psychologically, my mind thinks, okay, he wants me to stay awake. So it's meditation. If I go on my side, he wants me to go to sleep, so I go to sleep. Different posture for different things. Okay, Pavlovian conditioning, but it works. So if you want to meditate a lot lying down, have a different posture than when you um, are sleeping. And number two, if you want to meditate on your bed by crossing your legs and sitting on the soft mattress, that is very dangerous because you'll find that pillows are incredibly magnetic. <laughs> Before you know it, it's pulled your head down onto your pillow. Magnetic pillows. <laughs> So it's fine because there are times when you're going to be sick, uh, illness, in pain, dying. And don't think, oh, I've got sort of this terrible pain, fever, I can't meditate. Of course you can meditate. And wouldn't it be a terrible thing when you need it most of all when you're dying, in pain, about to just you know, slip away? If you can find a way of meditating then, it will be wonderful. But for goodness sake, don't be stupid and try watching your breath. Because you've already got a breath. Don't go sweeping the body, that really hurting. So instead, I just mentioned it, the Empress three questions. Now is the most important time, so if you're on your deathbed, now please, right now, whatever you experience, and this is the wonderful part of the Empress three questions, Whoever's in front of you is the most important person in the world. Whatever object can be a bodily sensation, can be another experience, it can be a mind state, whatever it is, give it maximum importance. It's the only thing you have. So be with it. And sometimes when people say to them, what's your definition of mindfulness? Okay, that's it. Being now, whatever you're aware of, Total importance. So you're not trying to get somewhere else. You're not trying to get rid of things. You're with whatever's right here. And obviously the most important part of that is also caring as well. Caring for it. You can always do that. No matter what stage of your dying process, what stage of an illness it is, you can always be right now 
you can always just give a pawn to what's in front of you. And you care for it. And then you're here. You are meditating. Best you possibly can do. Are the teachings of Ayakema more in line with Ajahn Chah's teachings or with those of the modern mindfulness movement? Uh, I think they're more in line with, with Ajahn Chah than with the mindfulness movement. I remember I, I came, uh, came to Perth once when I was the, the boss there. I said, oh, can you come and give a talk tonight? He said, you're inviting me to give a talk? I'm only a bhikkhuni. I said, of course, you know, you're saying it, give a talk. People are bored of my jokes, you may have some more decent jokes to say. <laughs> And so she gave a talk about jhanas and then afterwards she said, you're probably really upset I talk about jhanas. I said, no, I talk about them all the time. And I said, oh yeah, we teach jhanas here. And she was really stunned, she didn't realise that we did that too. But yeah, the difference is, it's, it's good sometimes to hear teachings, not just from one monk or one sayadaw or one bhikkhuni. Just have a a breath, because when you go to the three refuges, it's the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. You don't go to a refuge in uh, the Buddha, the Dhamma and Aya um, Chanda. You may have your preferred teacher, but that's not where you take refuge in. You don't take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Aya Kema or the Buddha, Dhamma and S.N. Gawinka or the Buddha, Dhamma and who else is around these days? You. You. Very well, I wouldn't sort of <laughs> take refuge in this month. Take refuge in the Sangha. And that means that you have a wide... Uh, uh, there's one monk or one nun you might really like, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to other monks and other nuns and hear what they have to say. Because, you know, we're all weak in some areas and strong in others. So, that's how we do things. Many of the people mentioned in the Sutta are kings who have renounced their wealth and attachment to wealth. How can those of us without wealth renounce that which we have not experienced in life? <laughs> okay, get some wealth first, wealth first and then renounce it. No. It's... They have a simile of the quail, that some people just, even a quail which is tied with a, with a little string, sort of can't break, I oh know, even with an elephant tied with a little uh, string, can't break that string, or something like that. It was just, some people haven't got much at all, and they can't renounce. And some people who have lots and lots renounce. You know, one of the nice things of when I went to Vietnam, I think Yen, I got it right, is there any Vietnamese here? Yen to Monastery. Because that was uh, just, when I went to a conference, they take us to these Ha Long Bay, because it's where you have to go to. And I just, I'm not a tourist. But one thing I did like, they took us to Yen Tu, which was a mountain which this is in um, the North Vietnam, the last side of Hanoi. And there was this mountain, got very famous because one of the kings of Vietnam at the time, or that part of Vietnam, he renounced. You know, he was a king, powerful, and he decided that he had enough of uh, being a monarch. And he went to this mountain, a really remote mountain, a long way up. And he lived there for the rest of his days. It was really impressive. Gave up so much comforts and lived in this really, really high peak up in the mountains. So that I really did enjoy going to. They had a tiny little shrine there for him up the top. And so you can have an idea, <coughs> idea of a simple temple, just built from rocks from the hillside. And sometimes they had to go down and get enough food to last for, for a couple of weeks or a month. And that's how they lived. So, it's whatever you or your wealth. Who was that 
uh, that I think you probably know him, Venal Siripanya. Uh, he was uh, half Malay, uh, no, actually half Tamil, his father, but his father lived in Malaysia, and his wife was Thai, and their son was Siripanya. And his father was the second richest man in Malaysia. He owns, uh, what's it, Maxis Telecommunications. And Sivan uh, Sivipanya came and stayed, I think, a few months in Bodhinyana in Perth. His father came to visit in his private jet. <laughs> he doesn't travel MH or Singapore Airlines or British Airways or anything, he's got his own jet. It saved us how much it costs to park it at an airport per day. It's thousands of dollars to get parking space. So this was the father of this monk. And this monk, you know, he would never have to work. Never need to actually, he wouldn't have any bills. He just wants to be a monk. And his father used to say, just, I've got so much money and my son is begging for food every day. So it's embarrassing. But why do people do that? Because you're much wealthier being a monk or a nun. Wealthy in the sense happiness, contentment, job satisfaction, and your retirement benefits. <laughs> we do out of the world. Anyway, next one. Artificial intelligence is advancing at a remarkable rate at some point. Would we need to consider an intelligent machine to be a being? I think human beings uh, stand out for being not intelligent, for being stupid. <laughs> If you can somehow get artificial stupidity, then I think you've actually cracked something. <laughs> <coughs> Somebody, this was again, this was from a cartoon, Calvin and Hobbes. I love Calvin and Hobbes too, that's a great cartoon. I remember just once when he was talking about the American Constitution. His teacher, Miss Wormwood, was actually just uh, about how wonderful the American Constitution is. At which point Calvin said, you just said it's our con constitutional right for the pursuit of happiness. If ignorance is bliss, by being at school, you're taking away my constitutional right <laughs> to bliss. <laughs> That's a really good argument. <laughs> ignorance is bliss. So, then going to school is uh, unconstitutional. <laughs> anyway, didn't get away with that, but it made me think a little bit. Anyway, the other thing he said, the surest sign, the proof, <coughs> that there's intelligent life in outer space is that none of them have come to visit Earth. <laughs> <laughs> How do stupid aliens would come down here? <laughs> Not intelligent life. <laughs> nice little quotes there. Anyway, thank you Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chandra for a wonderful experience so far. You mentioned that thinking is a sign of discontent. To what extent would you say this statement applies outside of meditation? Would you encourage reflections on the practice and the Dharma? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's especially in meditation, which is devoted to resting the mind and the brain, getting it very peaceful, and not just uh, thinking, which is just basically repeating old stuff, seeing something new, breaking boundaries, if you like, to actually have some insight, not old insights, reworking old ideas, but seeing things afresh for yourself. And so, but even outside in life, if you are in innovation, that's where, stop thinking if you can, and then you see things from a different angle. Even if you are in management, sometimes, uh, you know, I have problems in monasteries, things to do, and 
problems to solve, it just comes with the territory of being a senior. So what I do is often just I put all the information in the brain. I just you know, get all the, the um, research and then I forget about it. Forget about it for a few days. Meditate. Certainly I don't worry about it. And then answers come up by themselves from stillness. And the answers which come from stillness are always really, really good answers. And those are the ones which I make use of. <coughs> Sometimes like seeing things outside of the box because you are in a box, when it's a box of thinking, <coughs> old habits. So again, if it's you really want to do amazing things in your life, even out there in the world, get the information, do the, the research, and then stop thinking about it and see what comes up. <coughs> Dear lovely Ajahn Brahm and radiant Venerable Chanda, a question for you both to answer. I have been having some very vivid dreams since being on the retreat. Do you think the dreams carry meanings or significance or is it just perspective? That you will answer it because they're both of us. <laughs> Dreams. There was, I don't think I've said this here, there was this on a retreat which I gave over in Jainabur in Perth. This uh, retreatant, he was, he was European, I think he was from, from Italy. And he told me that he was very concerned, he had these really vivid dreams. Uh, in succession, one night after another. And they were some of the weirdest dreams I've ever heard in my life. And the first night, he dreamt he was a strand of spaghetti. <laughs> I've never come across that in all my years of teaching meditation. And the second night, he dreamt he was a piece of macaroni. He said, what does that mean? Because you're laughing, I think you know the, the answer. <laughs> He's, and I told him, it's obvious that when you really consider it, you're recollecting your pastor lives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> pastor lives, it's Italian Buddhist! <laughs> Crazy. But anyway, just... Uh, sometimes you have vivid dreams, it just means you're energised. So your dreams, number one, I've got more oomph to them. And number two is you can remember them more easily. It doesn't matter, vivid dreams, as long as they're nice dreams, they're not negative dreams. Oh boy, I'm dreaming this week. We talk about dreams, now that you've done something. <laughs> <laughs> Please can you describe in a practical way what it is like living without wanting? Happiness. Either when you have a free choice of something, how do you decide? You don't. <laughs> By the way, have you heard about the Buddhists? Oh great. They went to the pizza parlor and asked, can you make me one with everything? <laughs> it's even better when you make me none with nothing. That's even better. Then you don't get fat <laughs> <laughs> at the pizza parlor. Very good. You want to know what it's like? Uh, to have no wanting. Just go and look at the life of the Buddha. Then it's a life of service, you don't want anything. Nothing in it for you. So, at the end of this, already people have given me so much chocolate. <laughs> I just got it stashed up in my room. <laughs> I don't need it. I thought I had it. Sorry? You have it as well. Yeah, they give me lots of chocolate in there as well, yeah. So I will distribute it later on. But if you really want to, to offer me something, something really useful, just you know, get a nice little box, wrap it up, you know, in a Sri Lankan tradition in brown paper, and have nothing in it. So this is for you, Ajahn Brahm. Nothing. That's what I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Emptiness. So give me the gift of nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it's, yeah, <laughs> and. 
And once I've you know, taken my share of the nothing, and then I'll get the rest of you, anything left over. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. There's plenty, nothing to go around. <coughs> just all right, you know, they say this of rich people, really wealthy people, they want for nothing. Want for nothing, already there. Want for nothing, got nothing, want nothing. I have a question about Nibbita. I understand that it is a natural consequence of deep meditation to clearly see the suffering of the sensory world. Is there a useful way of developing this perception whilst we are yet to experience deep meditation? Or is it too easily mistaken for ill will? Thank you for the inspirational uh, stuff. So, yeah, Nibbita is just, I call it like nature's, just as a way of understanding, nature's ejection seat. So you're on the wheel of samsara, going round, around, 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 just sitting there doing nothing. You tend to just uh, still, you're not stuck on the wheel, but there's nothing to push you off. So just like in those old James Bond movies, you've got the ejector button, bang, and then you get ejected. Do you want to um, hear a really gross joke? I have to say that because otherwise you'll blame me. <coughs> About how did, uh, how did the Americans, the US Army, actually what the Army was actually US um, Air Force, invent um, mincemeat for, for use on um, uh, hamburgers. We had hamburgers today. But you know, it was, um, it was today, wasn't it? No, it was yesterday. It was today, yeah. <laughs> I live in the present moment. So, how, wh why was it the US Air Force invented um, uh, minced, minced meat? Because they put an ejector button on helicopters. Oh. <laughs> 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 Come on! <laughs> If I work on an F-15, then it's a work helicopter. <laughs> okay, this, <laughs> I won't try that again. <laughs> Did that give you Nibita, that joke? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Here we go. In access concentration, is it easier to see which hindrances need weakening to enter a jhana? No, because at that particular stage, upachara, you're just on the edge. Upachara means that the hindrances are basically all gone. But you haven't entered the jhana yet. So just before. So I always say, well, look, jhana's right in front of you. Why the heck don't you just take that one more step and get into a jhana, bliss out, have really lots of good energy, and when you come out afterwards, the hindrances, you know they've gone, and they stay gone for a long time. They're really sort of uh, knocked out for many, many sometimes hours. You have lots of energy, and really sort of uh, powerful mind. So that's why that it doesn't make any sense at all, if you know what access, concentration and jhanas are, why a person would not enter the jhanas. Number one, it proves it was access, or upachara, and number two, you're making the best use of it. Before babies have developed language, do they have good mindfulness and present moment awareness because they are free of labels? No. Because even before babies have language, what are you talking about? First time this happened, this was a non, I think I mentioned a bit about this, a non-Buddhist couple. They were Caucasian Australians, and they'd, uh, they had two kids, and they came to see me, not because you know, they were Buddhists, because they thought that you know, somehow these Buddhists understand this sort of stuff. Because they had two kids, I call them Peter and Paul, and uh, that's right, there was, Peter was the older one, Paul was younger, or something like that. And anyway, they were at home, just the elder, <coughs> elder kid was about two or three. And the young kid had just basically just come back from the hospital, only a few days born. 
And so one evening they said, OK, uh, Peter, go and say goodnight to your baby brother, Paul, who was in the sort of, uh, what do you call them prams or places you put babies? Cots. Cots, OK, that's a good word. Now what do I know? I'm a muck. <laughs> put them in the cot. And the, uh, say goodnight to your baby brother. So uh, Peter just leaned over, goodnight, Paul. Actually, it was the other way around, I think. He said, goodnight, Peter. And that was the, uh, the baby was Peter, and the elder kid was Paul. Goodnight, Peter. And Peter replied, goodnight, Paul. He's only about three or four weeks old. And Mum and Dad freaked out. I said, this can't have happened. So they never prompted their older son, Paul. They just stared in disbelief. And their son again said to his baby brother, Good night, Peter. And this time they were paying full attention. Good night, Paul. They heard it. Clearly. And it was in, not baby voice, adult voice, mature voice. And that freaked them out, so they wanted to come to a Buddhist monastery to actually ask, are we going crazy? Now, what's happening? We both heard it twice. And of course, this is, sometimes this happens. The <coughs> previous uh, incarnation of the previous life is still strong enough to create speech in that voice box. It has the, the uh, you might call the, the mental knowledge of <coughs> language from the previous life, and it speaks. And of course, as soon as I made that um, announcement to people, I got another couple, a Malaysian couple, they said, look, I jumped up, don't tell anyone, but the same thing happened to us. Our kids spoke when it was only just a few days old, and we haven't told anybody because they thought they think we're crazy, we're not fit parents. So that happens. So if anyone else has had that experience, you had a kid and it speaks. There's actually one famous case. This, um, oh, this young baby, this was actually happened in India. It was, uh, when it was born, it came out of its mother's uh, body and it said, this is my last life. <laughs> <laughs> there is no more. <laughs> Well, of course, that was a bloody sapper. I was saying, gave the world the one finger sign. That's Nibida. Okay, so, developed language, some of them, they come, and anyone, others who've told me, oh, there's this one mother in Perth, I like the weird stories. <coughs> Still in the hospital, hadn't we've been released from hospital yet with the baby. She breastfed the baby, she was you know, on the bed, leaning back, you know, with the, the bed just you know, leaning up a little bit. Just you know, breastfeeding her little bub. And after the baby had breastfed, the baby just, you know, she was just watching it, you know, adoring her newborn baby. And just, the baby just went to its tummy, crossed its legs in full lotus, put its hands together, <laughs> and assumed a perfect meditation posture. And of course, she was <laughs> wow, where did this baby come from? It meditated on her chest. Of course, she didn't have, <coughs> some time ago, she didn't have a mobile phone to photograph, mm -hmm. photograph it. That would be a great photo. And it's great. Now, people, if you photograph it, you made it do that. You could have got its legs and you crossed it. <coughs> but it wasn't fake, it was real. And again, sort of freaked her out. Babies sometimes, they come with history. They're not new. Sometimes you see those things, wow, what's going on? Yeah, still connected to her past life. My sister is going through a divorce. She finds it difficult to extend and practice method towards her husband. Is there any way to practice loving kindness towards someone who you find constantly irritating, annoying? You have to practice loving kindness to yourself, first of all. Why is it we always want to do loving kindness to others? If you go through a divorce, please give it to yourself first of all, strengthen yourself. Give yourself enough energy. And then when you've got energy and you've got some strength, then you can try loving kindness to other people. But if you're already really weak, you're so sensitive, 
something happens and then you fall apart, the loving kindness will fall apart too. So loving kindness towards yourself. And if it is to somebody you're going through a divorce with, <coughs> angry with, loving kindness at a distance. He always used to say this, to love the tiger but at a distance. Don't think that you're so amazing and go to a tiger or as King Cobra, there you are, King Cobra. You get your hand bitten. You know, on one occasion, so I came face to face with a Bengal tiger. Huge being. It was, it was actually just closer than you are, David, to me. It was amazing that I was not scared at all. There was no terror in me. It's amazing when you practice as a monk, all this time there's a big tiger in front of you, and you're not afraid. But actually it was before I became a monk, because it was in the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and a big bath. <laughs> Please excuse me for... I haven't got... I can't see my clock anymore. What time is it? How fast? Okay, last question for you. Before I go to the stupid answers again. <coughs> I struggle to relax my face muscles during my meditation. Sometimes my face is so tense it hurts. I try to breathe into it, flex and relax muscles, but it hasn't worked. Well, can you please advise what to do? Yes, easy solution, Botox. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. When it gets late and I'm tired, I get a bit silly. As you have found out by now. I'm not embarrassed about my silly side, it's amazing. Should be, I suppose, another thing I said. But no, don't try. It's going to be tense. Let it hurt. Whatever. <laughs> and then when you open the door of your heart to those feelings, then you find actually they get less. And you realise you're trying to get rid of those things. That much makes it worse. What do I mean? Well, you do this, you do that, you get feedback, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. Did that work? What do I do? You gave up. You let it be. You didn't try and change things. You allowed it to be. So it's a good little exercise for you. Keep on doing it until it just disappears. And you go, wow, it's amazing. My little toothache story. First it was a bug in Thailand. And a terrible toothache. And in a forest monastery there was no obviously mobile phones, no emergency telephone numbers. No, um, it wasn't even in medicine, in the cabinet, no aspirin or no Panadol. And actually that's one of the reasons why there is no uh, aspirin in the jungle. Paracetamol. Parrots et amor. Look at Jar Sato, that show. Really bad. I'm a bad influence on him. But anyway, it was just, I was going, sometimes that pain, why does the pain happen always in night time? You know, when you know, there's no telephone, there's no one to call, especially on the long weekends like Christmas when no one is working in the hospital. It is interesting, but anyway, it was late at night, I tried to meditate, couldn't meditate for my life at that time. Didn't know how to really meditate, just on being with something. I was trying to meditate on the breath, couldn't do it, just the pain was just throbbing. Drive me crazy. And I did walking meditation. Ha ha ha. I was running meditation. Because no. when you're really in pain, you can't do anything slowly. And then I decided to do pirit chanting. Ha <laughs> ha, that didn't work either. Because well, I, was, I wasn't doing pirit chanting, I was shouting at the top of my voice. I was desperate, I was crazy. And so you, you exhaust every possible trick in, you have in your book every way of trying to escape from the, the unendurable pain. And that was a wonderful time. Ajahn Chah used to call it, you can't go forward, you can't go back, and you can't stay still. So, there's only one thing to do. I'd always heard about, let it be. And that was one of the first times I did let it be. I just let go of trying to control it. I let it be. I heard that word, so I tried it, let it be. That was one amazing experience. As soon as you let it be, it wasn't the pain disappeared, it was replaced by bliss. 
One minute you were just crazy with pain, the next minute you were blissing out. And that was really weird, I never experienced things like that before. But that taught me the power of letting go. And I lay down, had a beautiful sleep for a couple of hours, because it was late at night. And I woke up, had a toothache. But it was only a small toothache, quite a big one. It's amazing just how your perception, the way that you use your mind, can change things. So sometimes it was worse having so much pain to learn how to let go. Anyway, anecdotes. Okay. Oh, it's there for pillages. Okay, <coughs> some pillages. Okay, so going back to the question, I've been having some very vivid dreams since being on the retreat. Uh, how to find out about the meaning of those dreams is you've got to investigate it. I can't tell you. So whoever wrote this question, you have the task this evening of having another vivid dream. So go back to bed and do your job. <laughs> Relax and rest. If you really want a vivid dream, it's a very scary dream. Please take a piece of paper and a, and a, and a, uh, a pencil or a pen and in the morning jot it down. He will send it to uh, Mr. Um, Stephen, so it's not Spiegel, Stephen, yeah, Spielberg, Spielberg. <laughs> we send it to Steven Spielberg because they really are looking for more plots, <laughs> you know, for action movies. And your vivid dream, especially it's a scary one, could be the next blockbuster franchise. Not Iron Man, not um, Ant Man, but Bikuni Woman. <laughs> Full of powers. <coughs> I once thought about that. Yeah, the, it was somebody actually saw Jen, Jessica Parker or something. She was the star of Sex in the City. Jessica something. Sarah Jessica Parker, is that it? Yeah. Sarah Jessica Parker. She was actually photographed in a coffee shop somewhere in the United States reading my book, Open the Door of Your Heart. Actually, it was the American version who ordered this truckload of duck. But wow! And they sent it to me. So this is my big chance. <laughs> Maybe I'll be invited to onto her show to do a cameo. <laughs> and they actually then they told me there's sex and sex in the city or something. Yeah. I was like, how can you have a show with Ajahn Brahman and Jessica some Parker? Um, so, so I'd have to actually change the title for the day. No sex. Only meditation in the monastery. <laughs> <laughs> and surprisingly, she never called me. <laughs> I wonder why. The ratings would go right down. Anyway, okay, so. Ah.